Today I'm joined by Mark Teuter. Mark is speed skater, former speed skater, junior world champion 1999. Yes. European champion 2004. Four. And Olympic champion 2010 in the King's discipline, 1500 meters. Yes. And the way to that Olympic title was paved with a lot of difficulties and adversities. And I guess we're going to hear more about that Good today. To that. Welcome, Mark. Welcome. Welcome here at our office, uh, Christian. Yes, we want to speak about that later. Mark has made a transition into a successful business owner. And we speak about that yeah. later on. Mark, as an athlete, what was your darkest moment? Oh, um, I think uh, my darkest moment was in uh, 2000, uh, 2000 when I, uh, I was world jun junior champion in 1999 and I came in a big uh, commercial team as the uh, newest uh, star coming up. So I was training for the Olympic Games in 2002 in uh, Salt Lake City. And uh, in 2000, I was doing really well, uh, almost became a European champion, the youngest Dutch guy ever, but I fell on my ass during the championship, so it was not all glory. But I thought I revenged myself and uh, I wanted to become an uh, Olympic participant in 2002 and maybe even Olympic champion because I was doing really good. But uh, I made uh, uh, some bad decisions that year. I was 20 years old, so I uh, 21, 20, and I had a lot of uh, bravado. So uh, <laughs> it was everybody who wanted to know. I told everybody I'm going to be the next star and I would train harder than anybody else. So I started to skip rest days. Uh, so I trained like literally seven days a week. Well, you know, that's not, uh, uh, you're gonna not uh, hold that for, for a long time. Uh, and we had a, a American coach, Peter Muller, uh, mm -hmm. and he was firing us up. Nobody trains like you do, Tootie. Uh, winning isn't everything. So I got fired up with all the athletes around me uh, and I tried to push myself harder and harder every day. And that went totally wrong. <laughs> I got overtrained, uh, not once, but a couple of times. And the whole winter, uh, during the winter of 2002, Salt Lake City Olympics, I was out with uh, Mono's disease uh, and uh, overtraining syndrome. So uh, I didn't skate. I, I maybe skated one or two races, but it was terrible. Yeah. So I, I remember I was in, in Inzol. That's like the mecca for speed skating in Europe. And it was November and really dark. Uh, uh, and it was really cold, minus 10, and we went uh, outside to skate. And I could barely even walk to the ice rink or let, let alone skate three laps, what I did, which I did. And then I thought, what am I doing here? I mm. uh, was totally tired, and but not. I, I didn't know I was tired, so I was kidding myself. I still thought I could make the Olympics, and I was still thought I could win. But everybody around me already saw that's, that's not going to happen. Mm. It's going to be... Uh, that was not a not a good winter, hmm. but I recovered luckily. But that was my uh, I think my darkest moment. And what did you learn from that moment? Uh, well, I learned two things. Um, I did. Uh, I I couldn't train whole winter, so but I had time on my side. So I think, well, what can I do? I can't train. I can only watch television. But if I watch speed skating, I uh, I go crazy. So I I uh, I uh, went looking for all the books I could find on uh, training literature mm -hmm. so I uh, basically uh, taught myself uh, by reading all those books and talking to a lot of people uh, uh, training uh, how training works how biology works uh, and after one winter I could just tick off all the boxes uh, with all the mistakes I made wh whether it be uh, a physical or psychological it was uh, I made <laughs> this <laughs> It was a, a, a rookie mistake, let's say. So I taught myself, uh, yeah, by knowledge, by by books, how uh, how everything works, how training works, how uh, periodization works, how weight training works, how endurance works, how your mind works. Um, so I and uh, I bought a guitar. So I learned myself to play a little bit guitar because else I would only be busy with speed skating. So I had to train my other okay the other half of my brain let's say not to go insane but <laughs> to to keep steady uh and it worked and i i recovered after that winter and i was lucky to 
uh, find a new coach in uh, Jack Ori. And mm-hmm. uh, he was then uh, a beginning, a beginner's coach, but he was uh, already a uh, um, movement science uh, university uh, scholar. So he had a lot of knowledge about training literature uh, and training uh, and developing training and developing talent. So when we got to work together, he was my coach when I, w- when I became Olympic champion. That was, that was for me, that was, uh, that was very much needed. Hmm. Uh, but I was lucky to have that second chance, I think. Hmm. Okay. I want to touch on another moment. Mm-hmm. Olympic Games 2006. You guys were in the semi-final in the team pursuit. Yes. And one guy fell. You were leading by a second, right? And you were the favorites. Yes. And one guy fell. Sven, yeah. Sven Kramer. Yeah. What goes, what goes through your head in these moments? Well, I wasn't in that race when uh, Sven fell. Okay. So Sven was, uh, he fell in the, uh, in the semi-finals. And we were clearly the best team by far. Uh, but not always uh, the best individuals, let's say. Maybe not the best team, but the best individuals. But that doesn't always make the best team. Mm. So we we thought, like in 2006, that was the first time the team pursuit was on the program. We thought, well, we, we have the best guys, so let's develop a really clever scheme. So we, we developed a scheme of uh, interchanging uh, with one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the first one who came off on top uh, went in a second. You you you're you're in a group with three, so we devised some really uh, uh, <laughs> difficult uh, way of uh, um, uh, uh, picking the lead. And Sven got lost, I think, uh, during during that semi final in which position he had to skate. So uh, Sven was skating. I think Karel, the other skater, one had to come underneath him. And he, he got lost, so he had he thought he had to go under, uh, to cut under the, the, the skater in front of him. And he, there was no room, so there were blocks. So he stepped on a block, and if you step on a block with your skates, there's only one way you will end up, and that's in the padding. Uh, so uh, that was uh, a gold medal lost. And we ice skated in the B final, and we won the B final, so we uh, still had a bronze medal. But that was uh, that was not a good thing. <laughs> How did you recover from that? Um, well, for me, that was a difficult Olympics too, because that was my only Olympic race in the first Olympic race. I didn't qualify individually, so that was sort of my second darkest moment. I, I two times I missed the games when I was 21 and 25, so at the peak of my career. Um, so I was I didn't skate individually. Uh, and I thought, well, everything I have, this is not gold, but I still have one uh, big opportunity that year, and that was uh, the World Championships. So I wanted to become world champion, and I trained for that also during the Olympics. I thought, well, the best way to avenge this is to become world champion. And then two days before the World Championships, I uh, wanted to tie my laces of my skates, and my back just went snap uh, when I did the first lap of skating. And I had to uh, visit the physio, and he's like, uh, "You're not gonna skate this weekend, for my friend. You're luckily uh, you're you're uh, you're uh, almost herniating." So uh, I'm like, "Shit!" So I had to fly back flat, did an MRI here, and all the doctors said was, well, "Good, you didn't skate." So, but I had to recover for one month, and then I thought, "Well." <laughs> Maybe I could bury, better bury up my skates because I, I missed the Olympics individually. We didn't want gold but bronze and I missed by injury the world championships. <laughs> so that was pretty dark too. But um, I came up with a new plan a year after that. It took me a year almost to recover from that. Yeah. And after a year I thought, well, I have maybe one chance only and that's going to be in 2010. On one distance only, my best distance, the 1500. <laughs> So uh, let's cut all the bullshit and just focus on one race, one distance for the coming three years. Mm. And that was a good decision. <laughs> so that's what I learned from that. Make, uh, make choices. Okay. What was your best moment? Ah, oh, that's easy. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, uh, that's the easiest question. Ah, yeah, that was 2010, 20 February 2010, the day I won a gold medal. That was uh, 
I re have been looking forward to that day a long time. So when everything came together on that day, I re already felt good a couple of weeks before. Mm -hmm. And hold all the season I was good, but not in peak form yet. And that wasn't... Uh, uh, the, it was also the the intention I wasn't in peak shape yet mm. I had to be that on the Olympics yeah and everything came together there the whole journey everything I learned physically mentally emotionally everything uh, uh, fell in, into place there the whole uh, training program we devised to get there um, uh, yeah that's that was that was the best I could be at that moment yeah and that was a great feeling. Yeah. Even if I didn't, I had, of course, gold is great. But knowing that day that I was at the best I could be, that was a, a, a relief for me. Yeah. So that was also adding up to me being able to push myself to the ultimate maximum. Because yeah. I knew it's not going to get better than this. So yeah. you better take this chance, but it might be the only one you get. If I'm listening around a little bit and my colleagues and people here in the Netherlands, that 2010 Olympic gold medal came a bit as a surprise yeah. from, for outside people. Yeah. Was it a surprise to you? Uh, yes and no. Um, no, I really trained for gold. Um, you believe in it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Also with my team, with my coach and maybe a couple of, there were not a lot of people <laughs> mm. believing that maybe... Maybe at home and maybe my my staff around me believed in the program, because that's that's I think if you if you uh, are a pro athlete you you have to believe in it. That has to be mm. your ultimate goal. If you're not going for gold, you you're not a pro athlete. Mm. You have to have have that aim. It's not always that you can manage to get there, but you have to have that goal, yeah. or else you 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 can better quit. So you have to have that, and I already, that's always what I had. I know, I knew, I was really convinced that if I laid down the best I could be, that could be enough for gold. Because also a 1500 meter, it's so close. It's a really difficult race, yeah. uh, and you can really, um, even if you're not the favorite, you can really. Uh, maybe it's a little bit easier because you're more the dark horse. So you can really stick to your own program, not let yourself get be made crazy or fed up with all the people who want to throw you around or, oh, you can do not do that or you're the top uh, dog here, you have to do it. Hmm. It's all, um, it's more easy to get a signal. A bit under the radar. Yeah, yeah, instead of all the blutter and clutter. Hmm. You can easily, it's more easy to follow your own program and keep to your own program because a lot of athletes i saw make the mistake that when it gets the most difficult part is two three weeks before a big race because you train hard you push your body to the max you push your mind to the max so you're gonna you're gonna suffer and with suffering comes who insecurity am i still able to manage this uh, maybe I cannot win gold or hell, uh, what am I going to do in the afterlife? What if I quit? Yeah. You're going to ask yourself big questions because you're tired. You're not in a top shape. Huh? If you're in top shape and you're uh, rested, then you're like, come on, I can take every anyone on. But then you're at the lowest of low. And that's where a lot of athletes are panic or uh, divert from their program because they, they're like, I have to do things different. This is going the wrong way. But the, 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 I think the, the goal is, or the hard part is, to in the two, three weeks before the big race, stay easy, stay calm, and keep confident, although you don't feel confident. So you have to uh, wait for it, for your shape to come. And you know if you're going to be rested, first you're going to feel tired, your body is adapting to the training, and afterwards you're going to feel great, <laughs> you hope so. <laughs> And afterwards, you hope to get that great feeling onto the ice. Hmm. And you have to believe in that and stay easy. And you have to believe in that. If you lost that, you lose that faith or you get carried away by your insecurities, then you're gone. Then you I saw a lot of big, big uh, talents make that mistake. So I thought, I'm not going to do that. Just stay with yourself. Believe in your program. Stay easy. Do the things you have to do. Have fun. And uh, really stay down to the basics, especially the last weeks before a big race like an Olympics. Hmm. 
if you could go back in time, 10, 15 years, what advice would you give your younger you? <laughs> well, I don't know if I believe in that question because if, if I would do that, if I do, would have done things differently, things would have played out differently, maybe. That's true. Uh, the only advice I would give myself is uh, keep, keep the faith. It will, everything will be all right. Everything mm. will... Uh, will fall into place although you cannot see that when you're 20 or 25 uh, it will fall into place just uh, and man that's kind of that's always the I had that for myself already I was not a guy who panicked or I always when I went down I stood up and the next day I made a new plan to keep pushing I never said to myself well maybe it's time to quit now let's mm. move on and do something else okay. so not a really, uh, not a specific advice, I would say. All the mm. things I, I uh, had to go through, I really uh, made me uh, wiser. Mm. So, uh, although I would have greatly, <laughs> I would have uh, missed them. It would not be, uh, uh, not be bad to not have missed them. It would be great if I had missed all those things <laughs> <laughs> for my feeling back then. But in the end, it was a really... Uh, a good learning school hmm. maybe the best like if you if you make the mistakes and you get confronted with yourself that's the only way you learn hmm. if you walk away or you don't you, yeah, you you get you hold yourself back because that's safer and not go the last mile then you don't learn it's it's you're always in the safe place hmm. and uh, I never took that decision that and that hurt me a lot but it's also learned a lot yeah that's, that's the place where you get better and you learn, I think. Also as an athlete, that's the place you have to search for because that's where, you're, uh, that's where you grow, yeah. physically and mentally. That's what they say, right? Uh, life begins outside the comfort zone. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah but that's, that's also how biology works. Yeah? You yeah. know, if, if training adaptation is just... The, the one who wins the race is also the one who can adapt the best and the fastest and can can hold on to the biggest training load for a long time. And that's because of the adaptations. But if you want to adapt, even at the pro level, and you're that well trained, you have to still come up with a new way to get the adaptations you, yeah. you want to perform even better. So it's always pushing, always pushing your level. Yeah. You can never stay anywhere and think, oh, this is a good place. Let me enjoy the view. Maybe you can do that for a couple of weeks and then it's gone. You can never stay there. And that's a shame, but it's also because you want to stay there. Life is pretty good from the top of the mountain winning gold. But with two or three months, you have to come down. Yeah. Although you don't want to. <laughs> and you have to come up with a new plan. More of a personal question as a mm -hmm. strength and conditioning coach in the strength and conditioning sports science world. We have this so-called long-term athlete development yeah. plan, idea whatsoever. Yeah. You seem to be a very successful junior athlete. Yeah, you yeah. also set a quite a few world records at the end of your junior career. Yeah. But you didn't crush it to the same extent as a senior in the beginning. No. Um, anything you thought that you... Um, let me re rephrase that. Often, some people critis criticize mm -hmm. that focusing too early on success in junior years yes. will have a trade-off yes. in senior years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know that theory. Theory. Well, let me tell you how I developed my. I I didn't go by the normal route. Like mm -hmm. in in skating, you have you're good when you're young. You get selected for a, a group of. Uh, pro uh, really good talent skaters talented skaters and you move up the ranks with me it was totally different because i first started skating when i was 12 so it's pretty late before i did uh, soccer and uh playing on the farm of my uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> my parents so i was playing was more playing uh from 12 years on i went I still did soccer and still did skating three times a week so i was busy six times a week from my 12 year on so that was pretty, that was a lot, but still, I was nowhere talented when I was 12 or 13 years old. I got past, up to my 14, 15 years old, I was maybe with races, uh, I was at the middle level. Mm -hmm. I wasn't at top level. I wasn't good 
I was good, maybe physically, but not technically. Not. I was not. Nobody thought then. Well, he's going to be good later on. Uh, better uh, keep an eye out. But what I did, I got a, a pair of inline skates in summer mm-hmm. when I was 14 years old, so I could cruise around in, uh, back home in the farm on our farm, and I I did that every day because I liked it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did I didn't I didn't go to the training camps for speed skaters, not not nothing of that, but I rode around my, the farm. I was more like a auto autodidact, mm-hmm. uh, self playing, self learning. Uh, and I, there was a guy coming to the farm of my dad, and he said, "Well, maybe it's. I see your 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 kid uh, likes to skate. Maybe he should do some races." So he took me to a race, and I got, I finished last or about last. I finished last on the race. So I thought, "Well, that's nothing for me." Uh, but uh, there was a guy who saw me skate. He said, "Well, maybe he can become something." And he uh, he talked to my dad and. My dad bought a new pair of skates because my old skates sucked. I didn't know that, but he did. So I bought, got a new pair of skates, and then I blasted away every day. It was getting much better, and I went faster. And then I decided to do another race, and I got third. And then I went on a podium with uh, some flowers, and I got an envelope with a little bit of money. And then I was like, whoa, what's this? <laughs> I was 14 years old. So uh, I got hooked on inline skating, and I was pretty i think when i was 14 15 i was at the top of uh our country in inline skating but there were only six seven guys inline skating so mm. it was not that hard to get there but i trained a lot by myself at home and with a, a junior selection one day uh, a week in summer uh, and still i sucked at inline skating uh, at speed skating up till i was 17 then 17 years old i became really good at inline skating also with the seniors when mm-hmm. I was 16, 17. And then I broke, finally broke in one year. Within speed skating, everything happened. So I was barely, I was training to compete at the Dutch championships. Not sure if I could compete at the championships. Mm-hmm. And then I got second or third at the Dutch championships in one year. So I took a different route. Nobody saw mm-hmm. me. And then I uh, could go for uh, for the Dutch junior team. They told me. You can go to the Dutch junior team. Isn't that great? I said, yeah, yeah, that's great. But you have to stop inline skating. I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> I got really good by inline skating. And I think this is fun. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not good for you. So I said, well, then I'm not going to go in the, Dutch, in the junior team. Fuck it. So <laughs> I didn't go in the junior team. And a year after that, uh, I still uh, managed to defeat all the other juniors from that team. <laughs> because I, uh, I said, no, I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you. Yeah. So that was, I did a, I took a different route. And yeah. for me, that worked really good for the later in my career yeah. because when I was 70, 18 years, I broke and st- I still, I trained four or five times a week and I did a little bit of biking. I was, I was not a developed athlete by a long shot. There were yeah. a lot of guys from my age who were doing weight training, doing uh, running training, specific running training, uh, cycling. I didn't do any of that. I just inline skated and speed skated. So I had a lot a lot to gain. So in the, in the years after that, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, I became, uh, I had a, a, a great deal to make up and to grow. I had a lot more potential to grow. So that's what uh, when I made, uh, I pulled away from my age group to the top. That's also one theory in the long-term athlete development that they say, you know, a broader education yeah. at younger years, yeah. different sports, yeah, I know. give you a better solid fundament basis for yeah. later improvement. Yeah, that to was my prove, case. Yeah, that point. Yeah, I know that, that proves the point because I didn't skate from when I was six years old, three times a week, skating, skating, mm. skating. Not at all. Mm. No, it kind of developed. I was a more a ghost in talent development. I wasn't on the radar until I was mm. 17, 18 years old. Interesting. What makes you a successful person? Or athlete, <laughs> a person or athlete, both. I both. Mean, you have been a successful athlete for sure. Yeah. I think you're also a successful person. So. What um. Else? Well, I believe in a theory of a current whack. It's the growth mindset, static mm-hmm. mindset. I think if you adopt a growth mindset, so you learn, always confront yourself. Well, hey, how can I learn more? Uh, do more. Uh, not afraid to fail. Mm-hmm. Not see failure as a 
an excuse or a, a way to uh, stop, mm -hmm. but a way to learn. I think that's uh, a big factor. Yeah. So not say, well, this happened. I can't do anything about it or I deserve it. I deserve to win. Oh, this bullshit. You don't deserve anything. You're just a person hmm. and you have to prove yourself and uh, get out there and uh, make something of your life and learn. And that's a fun part of it. Although sometimes it's hard to <laughs> hmm. a lot of things that can go wrong and will go wrong. Hmm. And that's yeah, that's in a company, but it's uh, that's also in a sporting career. I think that's in life. Also when? on a personal level, if you make uh, things, I, I'm I, I've gone through things with my with my parents in a in a divorce that was really hard, and my position in that, and and if you travel a lot and you're gone a lot, uh, and you have a family. How you, uh, how do you respond to that? How it's all, uh, it's that. And I think look for the good advice and the right people mm. to work with. That's, uh, that's a big factor too. Mm. So challenging, challenging the idea of the growth mindset. Everyone mm -hmm. has doubts once in a while. Yep. How do you deal with that? Confront them. See if uh, those doubts are, uh, if it's rational or irrational. You also have irrational doubts because... Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe you kid yourself. That can be in a positive way or a negative way. Um, so I think what helps a lot is to develop a sort of a stoic mindset. Mm -hmm. I read a lot about this. So it's it's in fact about if you can control, try to control what you can control and try to accept what you can't. So accept mm. things that happen to you. And it's not always your fault. Yeah. But sometimes... It's hard to deal with certain situations. You have to learn to accept the way it goes. But if you can ex can control it and you have an effort to play and a role to play, then you have to go all in mm. and be able to say, uh, well, I did all I could. I think that's a, a big part. Do you have a morning routine? <laughs> um, wake up the kids. And uh, <laughs> see him now. No, I, uh, I um I wake up with my kids, do breakfast, walk the dogs, and then I mostly go train uh, before the kids go to school. And uh, after I train, and mostly that's about the time the the traffic jams are over. Then I go here to the office or uh, on the road. I'm gone a lot on the road too for appointments and everywhere. So my morning routine would be uh, easy wake up, not not by a, by a, by sound, but mostly by light. I like that. A little walk with the dogs, family time, kids, and then uh, go out, train if I can first. Quick. I like to train first in the morning still. Why is that? Because it's energized, you get energized in your day. And if you sit a lot behind your laptop or in a car, then you're like, Pfft. but if you've trained, then you, if you do some deadlifts in the morning and you sit for the rest of your day, you sit a little more, more uh, upright. Mm. You feel, uh, you feel your body uh, strengthen. Uh, so it's, uh, it feels better. Mm. You get more energy even through during the day, not only the hours and, and the hours after you train, you're like, Pfft, you're open, you're really uh productive okay. i feel and i'm addicted to training maybe <laughs> a little bit cool <laughs> how do how do you prepare yourself for important moments <laughs> um well nothing comes close to olympic finals or, or world championships so so I have to sometimes do presentations for a, a big group but then i always think of an olympic final and it's It takes attention away. It's like it never gets so intense anywhere. So I'm not that scared. Hmm. Um, just the best way to, to prepare for big moments is to be prepared. <laughs> and be prepared really well. Hmm. Um, but there's you cannot prepare. There's, there's a thin line bet between preparation and over-prepare. So you have to prepare and... and Uh, go through your mind through all the scenarios what can happen how do you prepare uh, what's the plan etc etc but when you're at the moment itself 
you you need to get out of your head so mm -hmm. that's a kind of contradictory so yeah. you, you're in your head pl making a plan dealing with all the situations that can happen uh, and that's good because you have to be rational about that but at the moment itself uh, if you think too much you're acting like a robot so that doesn't work you have to let go of your expectations of everything you've learned and uh, trust on your inner in instincts or your training to take over so there's a certain moment just before a big moment that you try to relax and i did that while skating as an athlete with breathing techniques just Try to breathe in, breathe out, stay relaxed, mm -hmm. be relaxed. Sometimes uh, crack a joke with, uh, with uh, go to somebody and just talk to someone uh, one hour before, a half an hour before, just to release the tension. And just don't try to focus on the results in your head. Just let go of the results and just go. Mm -hmm. But that's hard. This is the hardest part to do because you're wired. You're so wired to do that in yeah. the whole preparation. You have to let that go at the moment to yeah. be in the moment. Yeah, and I would expand on that. In that Olympic final 2010. Yeah. I think speed skating is quite a brutal sport, right? It's you, the, yeah. ice, the ice ring. There's not much. And the space, time, right? It's you, hide, you against right? time. So yeah. what goes through your head before that moment? Um. Well, before you think, um, a lot of things go through your head. Uh, the uh, the uh, the hardest part is uh, to let the thoughts come up and let them go again. Mm -hmm. No, don't hold on to the thoughts because a lot of things will go to your head. Whoa, these are a lot of people. Whoa, millions of people are watching through television cameras. Ooh, are my legs good? I don't know. Maybe not. Only one chance. Only one chance. What if I make a mistake and then? Mm -hmm the chance you feel the thoughts coming but if you if you go on to that you hold on to that thought and you're like yes what what if this happens then you're gone so you need to re that's okay let them come let the thoughts come that's okay the only thing you have to do is stay relaxed but inside you feel your heart pounding and you're like it's a sort of state from from letting go and rest and and aggressiveness in the same time so you feel really aggressive really pumped up like well if the shot goes I'm going to give it my all and I go full gas, I'm not leaving anything, anyone behind. And at the same time, you don't want to think, okay, first, the first strides are good. And then if that's good, then let go. So I didn't, right before the race, I didn't one moment thought of how I should race. I just thought I'd done all those races in my head or literally with my body and every, everything there. I did so many 1500 meters, so I'm not going to do a better 1500 meters by thinking of how I should race. I already already did that. Uh, I, I'm going to do it by doing, after, after the gun goes off, I do the first strides really good and then just let it go. The only thing I tell myself that you, you have one chance, so go all in. You, I'm going to leave nothing behind there, nothing, not a single bit of energy. So you have to be really good today if you want to beat me. <laughs> and that's a good feeling for you. If you want to beat me, that's okay. But you have to come on top of your game. Yeah. And uh, if you have that thought and that feeling, that's that's so strong. Yeah. That's sometimes what you miss around in normal life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's It's the prey uh, coming together and the, the, uh, the hounds coming together and like, oh, who's going to win? Who's it's kill or be killed? That, yeah. that feeling. And that's uh, that's that happens once in a, a couple of years. That happens at the Olympics. Mm. It's kill or be killed. And mm. there's something cruel about it, and there's something really uh, beautiful about it. We touched on that before. How do you overcome setbacks? And specifically, I want to talk about. You've written a book. Yeah. Um, let me Sonderstreit Training over Training, training yeah. which can be translated as No Victory Without a Fight. Yeah, and that also seems to be your mantra. Yeah, tell us, tell, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I think if you uh, you 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 you're gonna win, whatever the definition of winning is for for you. Um, if you're prepared to go through through the hardship, through the shadow side, sometimes call it. Mm. Uh, if you, everybody has scars on their soul or makes 
uh, goes through things in their life. And I think the way you act on that defines you. So if you act on uh, that by hiding or wishing things would get better or um, looking for excuses, that's a way. That's a way. It's a coping strategy. That's okay. But if you want to win or get better or get everything out of life, you just have to confront it, take it, and uh, it hurts. But sometimes uh, uh, you learn so much from that. And it's another dimension sometimes where you have to go through to get to the uh, to the to the greater good, to to learning, to learning as a person, to personal development, but also winning a gold medal or yeah. uh, or making money or uh, do what you love. I think uh, um, that's the that's you have to learn through life. <laughs> And that's what life throws at you, and uh, how you deal with that, that's, that will define you. Mm. That's not that easy for, uh, for a lot of people, I think. And not for me either, but uh, I think if you want to live full, fully, you have to learn to do that, because it will give you so much back. Mm. So the idea is, despite of all hardship, you still believe... Yeah, that there will be a victory in the end. Victory, yeah. whatever. Yeah, victory whatever you define is. define yeah. as victory. I think the hardship is not something you have to run away from, but confront. Um, and uh, if you if you get through that, you're a stronger person by it. Hmm. So you know whatever life throws at you, you can deal with it. Hmm. And that feeling is a good feeling. You know, whatever life throws at me, that I'll. I'll challenge and I'll manage and I'll. Uh, I, I've met people in, in wheelchairs and they are so have a positive attitude. Mm. They're so uh, really. Uh, I'm, I'm fit. I was a pro athlete. I'm at the other side of the spectrum. There are people, uh, but still they 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 have a positive attitude and a mindset. So it it's not always like it's how you deal with it. It's you in life it's how you deal with those situations that will define you and you have a choice i think you can deal with it by letting go and that's that's uh that's that can be normal it can be life can be cruel can be hard but uh i have a lot of respect for people who by although they go through hardship and everything still are look positive on life and try to not let it define them But yeah, define them in a positive way, mm. not in a negative way. They don't get ap ap uh, how do you say that? apathies. Yeah, yeah. Apathetic, I guess. apathetic. Yeah, they confront it and take it head on. Mm. I like that. Who's your role model and why? Oof. Um, maybe a couple. Um. My role models would be in sports. It was uh, Opna Sundral and Itz Bosma, two 1500 meter speed skaters. And those guys were uh, always uh, challenging each other. And uh, we were, these were, uh, they were not like, uh, we're not pussies, <laughs> at least to say. They were powerful guys and also uh, mentally powerful guys. You know, if you race those guys, they're like, They're like monsters. They're like they will eat you up. Mm. They're not the not always the most gifted speed skaters, but heart in their head. You know they mm. they would accomplish what they want to do. They were they were able to train harder than anyone to 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 perform better uh, and to keep on fighting. So not the natural talented gifted athletes, but the mentally tough. So that these two guys were this for me. They're a generation before me, so I looked up to them and I was like, "Whoa, these guys do is really cool." And maybe some entrepreneurs. I like the guys who build their companies. It's not always the the famous ones, but who can do it in a way which um, doesn't uh, how do you say it in a in a durable way. Mm. So a way that 
they don't have to sell their company, but in a durable way that they manage and own their company and mm. grow it from the ground up, but not to cash out or uh, to build something that's l everlasting. Mm. Who would be an example of that? Um, I think Richard Branson is a really good example. And also to have fun in life with it. Yeah, he's kite surfing uh, with the photo models on his neck and he's building a really big company and having fun and challenging himself. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a great example, I think. Yeah. So it's not the, the, the pursuit of, of, or of money or, or being on top of the hill or a gold medal. Mm -hmm. Well, if I do that, or then pff, life will be fine. No, it's in the moment. The process. Building the process, yeah. Love the process, love the challenge, mm -hmm. love the, uh, the, the, the things you learn from that. And you only learn that by going through. Did you love the process as an athlete, or were you very focused yeah. on the outcome? No, I am really focused on outcome, if you're here too, within the company. And it's like, I want results. I'm really results driven. But if I look back, I think results drive me, but the process is the much fun. Mm. Every, if I, the, 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 it's not the, what I miss is not standing on a podium with a gold medal. What I miss sometimes in skating is working every day with the best athletes in the world. Mm. Every day training on, on not this level, but that level and mm. try to get it there. Mm. So every pushing the envelope every day with a group of really talented and, and uh, committed people. And that's the same for a company. If you do that every day, the process, that's, that's the most fun. Especially in the end. Of course, you, have, you want the results from it. Yeah. You have to push for results. And you have to dream big. And you have to yeah. keep pushing for the results. Because that's, I don't know, that's, that's maybe it's biology. I don't know exactly why you want, why do you want to win a gold medal? Why do you want the uh, a company to flourish and to grow? It's... It's the process that, that makes it fun, mm. and, and that's what there is every day. Mm. The win, the gold medal, that's maybe a day or a couple of months, and that can be satisfying, but that, that will come and go. Mm. It's, to, it's the challenge to build something which you learn and grow every day, and, and the f you have to look for the fun in that. Mm. That's, what I, that's what I had as an athlete. I really thought that was the most fun part. Mm. Challenge yourself every day. Look, making new plans. How can we do this? How can we do that? But of course, it's it, it makes it all worth worthwhile if you stand on top of the podium. That's that's the goal. That is the goal, and it's all tied together. Yeah. There's no goal without a process, and there's no process without a goal. What was the best advice that was given to you, and who gave it? I think the best advice was uh, to quit all round skating. <laughs> In 2007, I was seventh at the European Championships all round. I'm like, fuck, I'm not gonna skate for seventh place. That's that's ludicrous. I'm not gonna skate for sixth, seventh place. So, or uh, I'm not gonna do this. I'm gonna focus on one point, do a 1500 meters. I think Jak was at my coach. Together, we said, well, let's. Uh, focus on the thing you love best and do best and that's the 1500 meters that was a good choice mm. and that's uh that was good advice mm. to do it that way i think even if you would have not succeeded in yeah. 2010 yeah 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 even if because um i knew i the other the other option was no option I couldn't become first in the all-round championships anymore. We had Sven Kramer coming up, uh, the American guys, Sharni Davis, Chet Hederick, and uh, Enrico Fabrice from Italy. And they were they were just better than me. It was just not confronting yourself and saying, "Well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get there. I'm not gonna get to that level." That was not. That was just being realistic. You can want it, but. <laughs> You have to believe in dreams, but you really have to believe that you can do it. You not kid yourself, yeah. and that was kidding myself if I would have gone through that way. Yeah. So um, it was a hard choice, but 
even if I would have had that, then still I knew that was the only way. This I have to do it like this because I would get my I would uh, slap myself in the face. Would have been a missed uh, chance, opportunity. Yeah. How did a typical training day look like back in the days? <laughs> back in the days, like. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, or five years ago. Now, when I was... Peak of your career. I'm at peak of my career. And we really trained, we were like training smart. So when I was 20, 20 years old, I would train hard. A lot of hours, a lot of intensity. And we really got back uh, during 2010 towards um, polarized training more. So a lot of low, more low intensity training with some peaks of high intensity. Mm -hmm. Um, so everything, the whole training schedule was built around maybe two training in a week. And these trainings were in the winter was one especially was an interval training. So I, I would cut my 1500 meter speed up into blocks of 600 meters, 600 meter blocks. And I would do maybe in one training 5k, 5 kilometers on a, my 1500 meter speed. Mm -hmm. So in an interval based training. And that was the that was the key training because I would learn to I would do a lot of specific workout on specific specific 1500 meter speed mm -hmm. on a specific uh, specific intensity. Uh, but to do that and to be able to do 5k instead of 3k, um, I needed to build a really er good aerobic base on the bike, mm -hmm. uh, build a specific uh, weight training uh, around that. Um, and another part would be uh, an interval training where we did some longer intervals but less intensity. Um, so we w mostly the week would play around around two training, and that was b that was the height of the week. And afterwards we had rest, and we build the rest of our training around that. So when I would do the the the, the hardest training, the most specific training, I had to be rested before that training and recover after that training. Mm. So uh, mm. the whole periodization was written to to develop aerobic capacity anaerobic capacity weight specific uh, speed uh, to be able to perform those training at uh, a, a really volume based for those interval trainings uh, one or two months before the specific uh, races i did so it was really i think it was really smart training training smart planning so i would do two weight trainings a week one big interval or two big interval training on, on ice. So really specific the intervals we did specific on ice, on speed and uh, endurance training we mostly did on bike. Mm. So making the uh, aerobic low intensity training we did on bike, but also the, the aerobic higher intensity trainings we would do on bike because that's a controlled environment yeah. and speed skating is a little bit difficult to control in intensity. So we would play around with these trainings to, uh, to develop a, a schedule. And, and skating, speed skating is really technical and really coordinative. So you cannot overload yourself too much in training because it will affect your skating. So you can be tired, but if you're too tired, you're, you skate like shit. Hmm. And that's for some, if I'm tired, I can still bike. Yeah. But if I'm really tired, I, I damage my skating technique. Yeah. So that's for skating. That's really, it's really a puzzle with a lot of para parameters uh, you action. can play around with. Yeah, yeah. Cool. it's balance, it's coordination, it's weight, uh, speed, power, aerobic, anaerobic capacity, uh, power. Hmm. So uh, there's a lot of uh, things in there. I think hmm. it makes it uh, fascinating. Having been a successful athlete in this country. I guess a lot of attention has been on you. Yeah. How did you make the transition into normal life? I mean, you mentioned earlier in this talk that yeah. sometimes you miss the moments that you yeah, can't yeah, reproduce. Yeah. Wow, well, the first two years uh, was was difficult. You have to uh, search for new uh, goals and new challenges. And you're you're used to having one goal and go all out on that goal, and you know how to reach that. You know the plan. You know everything. But uh, that's gone so you need to get out there and do new new things 
and that's that's kind of hard to find your new goal, your new route, because you're so you, you you're so used to training and physically also a lot changes. Mm. You don't have to train anymore, so you could drink beer every day and uh, yeah. lay on the couch if you want to, because uh, that's what a lot of athletes do too. They're like, ah, I've had enough training for this lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do some other things. Mm. So, what, what is more difficult? I mean. You mentioned that also before the post-Olympic year. I mean, I guess everyone who has been in on Olympic campaign knows the year after the Olympics. Also mm -hmm. as a coach, I know that somehow yeah. it's not a good time. No. What's more difficult, the post-Olympic year or retiring? <laughs> no, retiring. Then, it's the, then there's no goal in winter anymore. So that's that's hard, but you have to just get out there and stay active physically, but also try to pursue new goals and you don't know what you're going to do some some people know I'm a little bit jealous of them mm. but you have to develop you have to uh, uh, find who you are besides sport so you have to do a, a lot of stuff learn a lot of stuff and see what you like see where you're good at but you, you start like back to you once you were 18 19 years old for your feeling it's back again to the roots and uh, you have to go through the whole same transition Again, a little different, but still has some similarities. If your six-year-old daughter tells you she wants to become Olympic champion, maybe yeah, yeah. speed skating, will it bring cold sweat on your forehead? <laughs> yeah, or no, you're crazy. <laughs> We're not gonna do that. No, of course not. That would be cool. If she wants to go speed skating, she can. She doesn't have to. It's like uh, I took her to the ice rink last winter, so. Uh, would be cool if she learns skating and if she likes it she can be whatever she wants hmm. but she has to learn she has to learn speed skating and they have watched a lot of speed skating i'm like for television i work for television in winter for speed skating so they always look they know uh they were in class last winter for the olympics and they were they knew better than the teacher you know who would, <laughs> who would skate and who would be the best skaters the female feel so they could tell a lot about speed skating already But uh, no, I knew uh, I needed my parents to 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 get there. You know, my mother, my father dedicated a lot of time in getting me from ice rink to ice rink or from inline skate track to inline skate track. So um, we'll see. <laughs> Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Uh, um, maybe. Uh, Johan Olaf Kos, Norwegian speed skater. He did like really brutal training. So uh, it was funny. He, he thought there was a story that he did 100 times, 150 uh, kilogram squats. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I think he was a really smart guy. He's a Norwegian. Um, because or he did that and he was like a training animal. Or he made people believe he did it. And everybody followed him and tried to do it, which killed them. <laughs> so I think the latter is true. Uh, and I was, I was, it was fun if I, if you hear the stories. I met him last winter. It's a really inspiring, uh, inspiring, inspiring guy. Where can people find you? And tell us a bit more about your company first. Yeah, well, they uh, they can find me online everywhere <laughs> by uh, googling me. Now I am what's the biggest part of my. Uh, time in my life now is uh, first energy gum so um with uh, two guys with three of us we developed uh an uh, energy gum which is a new category in uh, sports uh, nutrition and we are uh, a caffeinated energy gum so we're chewing gum with caffeine in it mm -hmm. and that works a lot of athletes uh use us uh, use our product uh, wh whether it be for the pro uh soccer clubs to the Volvo ocean race uh, sailors to the uh, BMX uh, uh, racers, uh, cyclists, uh, everybody, a lot of athletes, because I was looking as an athlete for a product like this, because I knew that caffeine worked, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, it it uh, makes, you, uh, makes you more active, more focused, and the perception of effort gets less, so you're, you're able to train harder a little bit. It makes a little bit of difference. Um, so, but I knew that uh, coffee alone was not good enough, or, or, or uh, a pill, because you you uh, absorb that through your through your intestines. Uh, via a chewing gum, you absorb the caffeine through your uh, through the linings in your mouth. 
So it goes straight up within 10 minutes to your brain and it works uh, like a charm. Mm. Uh, so I knew that, that, that's, that, that it worked like this, but I couldn't get it anywhere. So it not, was not for sale in Europe, America a little bit. So we decided to uh, develop it our, uh, ourselves. We call it first Athletes Energy Gum. So a lot of athletes uh, we have as a customer and uh, a lot of uh, sports enthusiasts, enthusiasts uh, too. So we're, we're a young company, but doing uh, doing good. And uh, first only based in uh, Holland, but uh, we're looking to take over Europe and in the end the world. <laughs> and I can attest to that. I tried it and it increases alertness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, you 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 know, uh, and it works fast, faster. Whether it, yeah, it, I take it before I go to do a workout, 10 minutes before, 15 yeah. minutes before, or if I uh, have a long drive in the car, or I have yeah. to study, or to be alert. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, what I noticed for myself, it also seems to be a bit longer lasting. I don't think yeah. you you don't get the. No. Nope. You know the rise and the fall Peak. of. Uh, Caffeine yep. pills or coffee. Yep. So yeah, we're it's without a little bit less, but it's longer lasting. I think that yeah. makes it very comfortable. And we're vegan, uh, not not uh, sh no sugar added. So um, yeah. and it's caffeine. That I think it lasts for five to six hours, almost caffeine. So you, I notice it when I when I uh, chew on uh, our gum. It it works f like a like a charm for at least two or three hours. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So anyone you want, anybody you want to try, go to uh, we www. Link, we, we link that up. Firstenergygum.com. Firstenergygum.com. So you can learn all about it. Firstenergygum.com. Thank you. Thank you for your time. That was. You're awesome. welcome, Chris.